Aaron Ramirez has been an assistant professor of biology and environmental studies at Reed since January 2018. He received his PhD in integrative biology from UC Berkeley in 2015, where he was a recipient of the National Science Foundation's Graduate Research Fellowship and the National Park Service's George M. Wright Fellowship. After Berkeley, he was a postdoctoral researcher at UC Santa Barbara, where he worked with natural and social scientists on interdisciplinary research projects aimed at addressing the rising risks of climate change exacerbated drought across the US. At Reed, Dr. Ramirez teaches upper division courses in the biology department and the environmental studies program where his research and teaching is focused on translational ecology approaches to studying the impacts of drought, wildfire, and climate change on forest ecosystems in the Pacific Northwest. Important themes in his teaching and research program at Reed are bringing field-based research and classroom experiences to Reedies and engaging them in a translational science process that involves interacting with the end users of science in order to accelerate the uptake of new findings and practical applications. Erin, we know that you are in high demand today, so we are very, very grateful that you've taken the time to be with us today. Uh, I hand the floor to you. Excellent. Thanks, Aaliyah, for that introduction. And um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be with you all today and to talk about the research program and teaching program that I've been able to build here at Reed over the last few years. Um, also, just want to thank you, Olga, for um, staying on top of me with the requests to be part of this event. It, and I'm really looking forward to it. It was fun to think about um, the last few years and, and think about what kinds of things sharing with the alumni might uh, you might appreciate. So um, uh, I know in, in in other talks, they might dig into a little bit more of the, the weeds with a particular research project. I decided to take a step back and maybe look a little bit more broadly at the research and teaching program um, that I've been looking to build here at Reed. And uh, since this is my first time interacting with most of you, I thought maybe a little more of a personal introduction to myself and to the research that I do with Reedies would would um, would be of interest. So, without further ado, let me see if I can navigate the difficult task of screen sharing today, and uh, maybe just give me a thumbs up if everyone. Great, thanks, Olga. Everyone can see that. Uh, great. Okay. Well, I'll start. Um, by talking a little bit about the person behind the science a little bit. I come from a, a Mexican American family in the Central Valley of California um, for about as long as we can trace back our heritage is in the Central Valley of California and we became US citizens um, in, during the annexation of California following the Mexican American War. Um, I grew up outside of Bakersfield, California doing a lot of hiking and fishing and um, general enjoyment of the outdoors um, and really attribute a lot of my scientific curiosity to my father, pictured there in the lower center picture, um, who was a middle school science teacher in a migrant farm working community outside of Bakersfield. This is a picture of him with one of his heroes, Jane Goodall, at a speaking event I was able to take him to a few years ago. He's showing her a picture of her in, from his classroom um, on his hero wall and reading her a blurb about why she's his hero. Um, <clears throat> the, the photograph in the lower right is um, who I, I really blame for, uh, for getting me interested in doing research as a career. This is Dr. Kenneth Gobley. He was one of my professors at California State University Bakersfield where I did my undergraduate work. Um, and was the first one that really helped me start to see a place for myself in the academic community and, and see that research might be something I wanted to do. And a lot of the work I do with Reedy's comes back to those um, early experiences with my own undergraduate professors and the way that they um, approached doing research with me is still a big part of the way that I do things. Um, Dr. Gobelet was an ichthyologist and he was a comparative vertebrate anatomist and I sorted fish fossils for him for a couple of years um, and, and decided pretty quickly that that wasn't uh, my, the research direction I wanted to go in. 
Um, but the following year, I got an opportunity to do um, some field ecology research as part of a National Science Foundation REU or Research Experience for Undergraduate program at Pepperdine University. And this was the first time where I could really see my interest in the environment and the outdoors coming together with my scientific curiosity through field ecology and, um, and really was uh, the, the starting point for me as an ecologist. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna actually go back in time a little bit at the start of my talk to, to talk about this early research experience because it still is so influential in the way that I approach doing research with Reedy's. So the first part of the talk today is uh, what I call a translational ecology story. So the, the jargon that I'm using here hopefully will be a little bit more clear by the end of the talk today. Um, but that jargon comes from an editorial that was written in 2010 by Bill Schlesinger, who was an ecologist at the Cary Institute for Ecosystem Studies in Millbrook, New York. And in 2010, um, Bill Schlesinger was arguing that there is a mismatch between the urgency with which we need to make evidence-based decisions to solve environmental problems and the pace at which that information is being provided by the scientific community and translating into meaningful actions. And he articulated that in this way, that despite producing an enormous amount of new information, ecologists are often unable to convey knowledge effectively Unless the discoveries of ecological science are rapidly translated into meaningful actions, they will remain quietly archived while the biosphere degrades. And this key component of rapidly translated into meaningful actions, when I read this in graduate school, it had a big impact on me and, and forced me to think critically about the way that my work could um, influence practice in, in more intentional ways. And, and actually it gave me a new perspective and appreciation for the work and experience I had as an undergraduate, which um, in retrospect was a very translational process, even though it took place before this article was ever written. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that research and, and um, characterize the components of it that made it a translational ecology project and then um, and then use that as uh, an example of, of the kind of work that we do with Reedy's here. So this, is, this was ended up being my first publication. We published the work that I worked on as an undergraduate. That work took place from about 2007 to 2009 and was focused on um, a question revolving around um, native uh, vegetation on Catalina Island, which is one of the Southern California Channel Islands off the coast of Southern California. Um, some important context for understanding the ecology of this system are that uh, Catalina Island is uh, squarely within what we call the Mediterranean type climate region of Western North America. So um, if you look across the globe, um, we have Mediterranean type climate regions on the west facing coasts of major continents uh, at approximately th between 30 and 40 degrees north and south of the equator. And so these similar positions on major continents result in similar climate patterns that are characterized generally by relatively cool, wet winters and warm and dry summers. Um, there are, are those of you that spent a lot of time here in Portland know that we have a similar Mediterranean climate um, here as well. Um, an important component of this is that those warm, dry summers result in regular exposure to drought conditions or, see, or, or seasonal drought conditions. And as a result, the, the plants and other organisms in these systems are well acclimated and adapted to these drought conditions. In addition to the annual droughts, this region also experiences interannual droughts. This is a graph uh, from something called the US Drought Monitor. Um, the x-axis here is time from about 2000 to, to 2017. And the y-axis here is showing the percent area of, the, of Los Angeles County that is experiencing drought at any given time. Um, and you can download these maps for, for anywhere around the US. It's freely available on, on the us.gov uh, website. But um, the way to interpret this, the redder the colors are, the more extreme the drought is, 
And uh, the context for this study was that in 2006, Catalina Island had experienced its largest recorded wildfire um, uh, on the island in many, many years. And, um, and the year following that fire was at the time the driest single year in recorded history for that region. Um, now you can see if you look ahead in this graph to more recent time periods, um, California has experienced a lot more extreme weather conditions in recent years, but at the time, this was a important context for the study that we wanted to know what the interactions of this historic fire and historic drought were on the native ecosystems of Catalina Island. The second thing to know about the ecology of this system is that the ecosystems are incredibly well adapted to fire. Um, the native landscapes of Catalina Island and much of Southern California look like this, dominated by woody shrubs and trees that um, form a dense closed canopy in the coastal mountains of the islands and the, and the mainland. Um, these systems are capable of surviving um, high intensity wildfire. And even when the vast majority of the above ground biomass is consumed by the fire, these systems are not dead, they're um, quite, readily still alive. And within the first year after fire, post-fire annuals that are stimulated to germinate by the fire will um, regenerate and the shrubs and trees in those systems will survive from underground root structures that regrow or from seeds as well that are stimulated to germinate by the fire. And within a matter of a few years, these systems can regenerate to look basically like they did before the fire and this incredible resilience is part of um, their adaptations to this uh, high severity fire regime in Southern California. Now, the third thing to know about this particular ecosystem on Catalina Island is it has a interesting history with large mammalian herbivores, um, many of which were introduced to the island. So, um, Catalina Island is an oceanic island, meaning it was never connected to the mainland. It arose from tectonic activity off the um, coast of, of California um, and has been continuously above water for at least the last 300,000 years. Um, so in that time frame, plants on the island had no um, natural pressure from large mammalian ungulates, um, but that history uh, is different more recently. And in the last couple hundred years, many different organisms were introduced to the islands. Initially, goats were introduced by the Spanish as far back as 1820s. Um, later, uh, cattle and pigs were raised by, um, by ranchers on the island. And more recently, bison and deer were introduced to the island in the 20th century um, for different purposes. The deer introduced for hunting by the Department of Fish and Game. And bison, interesting, were, were introduced uh, as part of a movie set for a Zane Gray um, movie in the 1920s um, and left out on the island and they have a, a, an extant population on the island. But at the time of this study, uh, we were really only um, interested in deer and bison. The, the other ungulates had been removed from the island prior to the, the, the time frame of this study. And so right from the beginning, um, an important component of this research was the need to balance our scientific objectives and the objectives that managers had for, for the island. Um, so we worked closely with the Catalina Island Conservancy, uh, which is a nonprofit um, conservation group that manages Catalina Island. Um, the, our scientific objective, as mentioned earlier, was this interaction between historic drought and wildfire. We knew that climate change projections for Southern California were for more of these kinds of events, and we wanted to use this as a learning opportunity for what that meant for the ability of these ecosystems to respond to, to fire and drought. Um, the, but the managers on the island, in particular the Catalina Island Conservancy, their primary um, 
management interest was in what 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 are these non-native um, herbivores doing to the ecosystem? And so this was our this was a the first a case of this research being what I consider a translational process where the needs of the manager and the needs of the scientist were integrated right from the start. And we were able to design an experiment that provided information that we were interested in answered basic science questions, but also was um, influenced by the needs of the manager. And we were able to adapt the, our study design to those needs. And so the way that study was developed, we, rather than just monitoring regrowth of vegetation, in burned and unburned patches, we included this treatment of um, deer exclosures where we built these large exclosures that prevented deer from being able to get in and, and eat the vegetation as it regrew. These were large exclosures about the size of a tennis court with deer fences all the way around to prevent the deer from getting in. Um, and we uh, and we monitored the recovery of vegetation inside those exposures as well as outside in burned areas and unburned areas and used that information to, um, to answer our research questions. Uh, a variety of methods were used and a lot of these methods are those that I still use with students here at Reed, but a lot of our research is uh, what we call ecophysiology combines ecology methods and plant physiology methods to give us insight, not just on what plants are doing in terms of their growth and mortality and recovery, but also the physiological mechanisms behind that growth and mortality and, and recovery. And so we were looking at things like plant water status, um, the gas exchange or photosynthetic um, physiology of the plants, as well as their patterns of growth and mortality as they recovered from the fire. And so without going into a ton of detail here, I'll point out a couple of key findings from this study. Um, the first is highlighted in this figure here, which is showing you something called predon water potential. So the way to interpret predon water potential is that it's a measure of the quantity of water available to plant cells for physiological function. Um, the x-axis here, I apologize, is cut off, but is time. And so this study took place over two years following the fire event. So this is uh, the same measurement over a two year time period. And the Y axis, the way to interpret that, values closer to zero are cells that are much more hydrated. And as you move down that Y axis, the values become more negative. That is indicative of more dehydrated tissues or less, less water available to the plant. These horizontal lines here on the graph are representative of critical physiological thresholds. In this case, the red one here is what we call the turgor loss point or the point at which the cells lose enough water that they lose turgor pressure in those cells. And, um, and that has an effect on their ability to grow and, and perform other physiological function. But the take home message from this part of the study was that despite the record drought conditions that I mentioned earlier, the plants stayed relatively well hydrated. Um, the, despite this being a record drought year, especially the plants recovering from the fire, those top two lines there are both the browse and non-browse regrowing vegetation. They were incredibly well hydrated throughout this whole time period. And that showed us that even though there was this big regional drought, for whatever reason, these plants were relatively buffered from the experience of that regional drought. And drought was not really an issue with um, driving uh, any changes in the resilience of the system. We subsequently did additional research that showed that this is a general pattern for these systems, that islands are relatively buffered from the regional drought conditions of the Ca California mainland as a result of, that st of a strong maritime influence that brings additional summer moisture in the form of fog and relatively cool temperatures that reduce evaporative demands on the plants. And, and this has likely been the case throughout the history of um, plants on Catalina Island. It's an important part of why we have uh, so many unique and rare um, species on those islands compared to the mainland. Okay, the, but despite 
drought not being a big factor, there was lots of mortality. Um, but all that mortality was concentrated in the plants that were browsed by the deer. So it's important to note here that without the influence of the conservancy and, the, and needing to integrate their interests into this study, we would have missed this, this important picture that the drought was not the major driver of changes in resilience of this system. The, the deer browse was the major driver. And um, so much so that by the end of our two year study, 90% of the plants outside of exposures were dead of the, of the major um, species in, of woody plants. Um, whereas 90% of them inside the protected areas were still alive. So a complete flip flop. Um, and this was originally really surprising to us, the levels of deer browse and how impactful that was to the vegetation. We did subsequent work on those islands and, um, and showed that at least part of the, the story there, the reason why this deer browse is such a big issue is that the island plants are not as well protected from those herbivores as they would be in mainland environments. And the, the islands, uh, island plants have reduced ability to defend themselves and increased palatability for ungulates. Um, compared to mainland relatives, likely as a result of acclimation and adaptation to that unique island environment, which has a long history of no herbivores. Okay, but the big take home message and the, the real interest for the conservancy in this work was that the ecosystems that they are there to manage failed to regenerate from this fire, except in these places where they applied targeted fencing. Um, and you know, so much so that there was an over 90% reduction in the major woody species in these areas um, from before the fire. And so that's, that's huge. Most of the endemic um, and native woody plants were, were being impacted by this effect. Now, um, importantly, this study, as I mentioned, took place um, following a fire in 2006. The next year, 2007, there was another fire on Catalina Island, an even bigger one called the Avalon Fire, which burned 10% of the island, threatened the town of Avalon on the island, um, was a big deal and immediately became the chief management interest of the conservancy because uh, many um, rare and endemic uh, plant populations were consumed in that fire. Now they came to us and we were really early in the study and they said, we know you're still working on this, but is there anything from your early results that would inform how we manage these areas that just burned in the Avalon fire? And so we didn't have this whole picture yet. We didn't have the full two year um, data set yet. But we did have part of the picture. We had we knew this much already, and because of that close connection between the science and the managers on the island, we were able to communicate that early and often um, with them. And although we didn't know that there was going to be ninety percent failure of those of those major woody plants, um, we did already know that there was about at least fifty percent mortality in those sites um, and that fencing was um, effective at reducing that mortality. As a result of that communication, um, they made the decision to fence in a major portion of that burn area, uh, uh, over 10% of that burn area. It was a large investment for such a small group. Um, and the result of that, one of my favorite pictures uh, in all of my years working out on Catalina Island is this one. This is a hillside. Um, what you see here on this hillside is a, a, a rare native plant that's endemic to the California Channel Islands. This is Ceanothus arboreus, um, only found on the California Channel Islands. And prior to the fire, there was only a few individuals of this particular species left in this area. And you can see, actually see their skeletons up along the top of the ridge there. Those were the surviving adult trees of this population. Um, for many decades, uh, these trees pumped seeds into that soil storage seed bank that was triggered um, by the fire. And the Conservancy's decision to fence that area in 
protected this incredible recovery of this rare species and actually in, which increased in abundance in response to the fire um, compared to the pre-fire condition. So um, I, I love this spot. Whenever I'm on Catalina Island, I go back and revisit this spot and the Cenothus arboreus there are still just doing amazing. And it's a great example of um, how uh, meaningful action can influence um, conservation issues like this. Okay, so, but in addition to strategic fencing, the Conservancy also made different decisions about the way that they controlled the deer populations and increased um, hunting tags. Uh, they haven't yet made the decision to completely remove the deer, but, um, but citing the, our work in many ways has helped them to um, have those difficult conversations about um, how to manage the, the, the multiple um, objectives of, of these systems and to um, make decisions that are good for, for the ecosystem based on evidence. Okay, so again, that study happened before Bill Schlesinger ever penned this editorial, but in reading this in graduate school, it gave me new insight into that early research experience. Um, since Bill wrote this article, um, the field of translational ecology has matured into uh, its own subdiscipline of ecology, and there's a lot of expansion on the, those original ideas and theories of practice for, for how to do translational ecology. Um, but for me, this, this, uh, the, the principles from that early research experience are still ones that guide um, the research program I, I have here at Reed. And, um, and we delve into this, this literature with the students as well. Okay, so that's, that's the, how I got started on this journey of translational ecology and why I think it's important. Um, I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk talking more specifically about the work with Reedies in this area um, and using a phrase that some of you may be familiar with. We utter it a lot as the faculty, I guess I don't know how common it is for students to hear this, but research is teaching is research is something we say a lot in the faculty. And um, I wasn't familiar with that phrase before coming to read, but in these first few years, I've, I've come to learn or at least understand for myself what that phrase means. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what I think that means for, for the program we're building. So this first example is um, where our research program really helps inform and support the teaching that we do, the teaching program that we have in both the biology and environmental studies program. Um, and it has to do with some funded research we have on understanding climate resilience and managed forest systems around the Pacific Northwest. Um, this research is funded by the Northwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, which is an entity of the U.S. Geological Survey that funds um, important climate change related research that has um, an applied focus to it and, um, and is in close partnership with many different organizations, the Nature Conservancy, the Forest Service, BLM, the Klamath Tribes in Eastern Oregon, the at Washington and Portland State University are, are important partners as well. Um, and really the, the idea with the project is to help develop new tools that managers can use to assess the climate resilience of the stands that they're doing ecological restoration in, in different forest types. So um, dry pine forest, ponderosa pine forest at Saikan Marsh Preserve is one of the areas illustrated in that picture there in the center. Um, mixed conifer forest near the, the city of Ashland in the klamath Siskiyou eco region, as well as um, coastal rainforests up in southwestern Washington. Each of those areas have different um, management objectives and, and different approaches to the type of restoration that they do, but we're helping to develop some common ways of looking at climate resilience and how, how effective those um, restoration projects are at achieving their goals of climate resilience. Okay, so like a lot of the research here at Reed, the this um, project has been a great umbrella for a lot of undergraduate research. Um, and I'll talk just uh, um, about one of these as an example, but um, both in the classroom, 
um, my upper division biology class, Leafs to Landscapes, um, does in, does original research as part of the, the design of that course. And the research from that class has helped to achieve some of the research objectives for our overall grant. Um, likewise, summer and thesis research uh, is also um, an, an important component of connecting students to this, this larger project. And um, I'm gonna talk just specifically about this exam, this one example from um, the 2019 iteration of my Leafs to Landscapes course, where the students worked with the Nature Conservancy in Saikan Marsh Preserve to provide um, some feedback on um, the effectiveness of restoration treatments in those areas and, and some um, management recommendations for, for them going forward. But before I do that, I'll just step back for a second to talk about this class more generally, which is my favorite class that I've ever had the opportunity to teach. It's based on experiences I had teaching at Berkeley in a class called Ecosystems of California, where we um, spent the semester traveling all around the state of California. Every week there's a field trip and, um, and we learned the major components of the Ecosystems of California. This class is similarly designed, at least in the first half, to be a field-based ecology and natural history class where we travel around to different um, forests in the Pacific Northwest. This picture on the top is um, from the klamath Siskiyou ecoregion in Southwestern Oregon. We go up to the Olympic rainforests. We um, visit a lot of spots in the, in the Cascades and is really, um, the key way for me to get students involved in, in field-based classwork. Um, the second half of the course is designed to give students a translational ecology research experience. And so we connect the students with a, a stakeholder that they can work with that will articulate issues uh, that are of import to them and their organizations. And the students will work with them to um, to do original research that helps address those those needs of the stakeholder and then communicate that back to them. Um, so this um, natural history, ecology, um, the, the research and the translation of that research into practice is, is all part of this course. Um, I'll also continue my tangent just a little bit longer to say it's been really fun to learn about some of the legacy and heritage of the biology program in developing this course. Um, uh, I've been especially attracted to the approach that Bert Brem used with students for a long time to get students into the field through his course Bio 251. And actually Keith Carolee gave me his binder with um, syllabus and, and um, all of the field trips uh, when I first got to read. And I've, we've actually been able to incorporate a lot of Bert's um, class, uh, class from back then into our, our class today. And we revisit a lot of the places that um, maybe some of you went to with Bert or know people that went, went to the field with Bert. Um, one of those is the Sandy River Gorge um, outside of Portland where Bert did a, a lot of his work with students over the years. And um, we've been able to reestablish a connection with the landowners there and get Reedy's to, out there for coursework through Leafs to Landscapes and also um, thesis and summer research as well. Okay, but back to this example of incorporating translational ecology into the classroom. The goal of this project for the students was to have them engage directly with TNC managers to learn about the type of management they do, um, why they do it, and what the objectives of that management were. And then to develop original research that helped examine the effectiveness of recent restoration efforts, especially those that are targeted at reducing the risks of high intensity wildfire and the impacts of drought, um, and do that by comparing managed and unmanaged stands in those areas. They also did sort of a cost benefit or sort of an evaluation of different management approaches, in particular, the use of prescribed fire versus selective harvesting or thinning 
and combinations of those treatments to um, report on which of those approaches were most effective for achieving their management objectives. And then draft a report with the, those findings and with some clear recommendations for the, the conservancy to consider going forward. And so um, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I will just point out one for those of you the, the, that are excited about data, I'll show one, one data slide here. Um, again, this is a measure of the water status of plants. So pre-dawn water potential, that same measurement we looked at earlier. And so we're still using those kinds of approaches with students um, to, in this case, they're, where they're examining the effectiveness of treatments in increasing water availability to the remaining trees in the stand. Um, and in this case, they're looking at um, stands that have been had prescribed fire applied to them, stands that have been selectively harvested and then having prescribed fire applied to them versus controls or unmanaged stands. And in, in this case, the interpretation that they are focusing on is that the stands where they're using prescribed fire only were highly effective at achieving the larger objectives of increasing water availability to remaining trees that they also see with the thinning and burning treatments. And this is important because um, there's big differences in the cost effectiveness of these different management approaches. Prescribed fire is very cheap for um, managers to apply relative to um, doing that in combination with selective harvest in these pine forests. And so um, showing that they're achieving some similar objectives with the cheaper option was a, a major finding of the report. And so they then wrote a clear recommendation to the Nature Conservancy um, that expanded use of this particular treatment uh, might be warranted. And they supplemented that with an understanding that they developed through additional literature review and research um, uh, showing uh, 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 art articulating a novel approach to the use of prescribed fire that allowed to keep some of the best parts of the other treatments, um, but do so in a way that was cheaper and could be applied at a larger scale. Um, so this report was delivered to the Nature Conservancy at the end of the class in 2019, and they made a presentation to TNC. Um, just last week, I received, oh, before that, um, the Saikan Marsh Preserve, so many of you may be familiar that the largest fire in Oregon so far this year was the bootleg fire in Eastern Oregon, which reburned or which burned a large portion of Saikan Marsh Preserve. Um, and so there's been a lot of interest in seeing how those treatments that were applied in Saikan Marsh held up to this wildfire event. A lot of those were designed to reduce the impacts of, of eventual wildfire on those systems. And so this was an important learning opportunity to see how well they held up and an opportunity to see if what the Reedies had advocated for um, was, was uh, also supported by the evidence in this new fire situation. Um, so this is a figure I'll, I will sh talk you through quickly. The image on the left is um, from satellite imagery that depicts the severity of the fire um, across the, the landscape of the Saikan Marsh Preserve. The red line there is showing you the perimeter of the burn. For the most part, it's missing sort of that upper left portion a little bit, but those black hatched areas are the different management units that um, TNC has, has been um, working in over the last several years. And then what we did was we did an analysis of the burn severity in these different management units and compared them to the untreated um, situation to show the effectiveness of these treatments in reducing fire severity, which is one of their key objectives. And so I'll just highlight uh, this a little bit more clearly, but basically that prescribed fire only treatment did um, achieve most of the, of the result that um, the more expensive prescribed fire mechanical harvest um, treatment did. And so this was an, another um, example of uh, 
of what the Reedies were, were articulating in their report that this treatment can be highly effective at achieving the management objectives in this system. And just last week, I received this email from the director of Saikan Marsh Preserve, who had been rereading the, the Reedy report from 2019 with fresh eyes and with this new context in mind from the bootleg fire and um, congratulating them on the on their contributions to the way TNC is thinking about that and continuing to plan their restoration there. Okay, so to sum this portion of the talk, I'll just say that I think this is a really critical part of, of how we do research and teaching at Reed that we need to support the students with competitive externally funded research programs that connect them to um, organizations and to other researchers outside of the campus. And that becomes an important um, platform for both in-class projects and thesis and summer research fellowships um, that connect students to, to real world translational ecology opportunities. So the last part of the talk today, I'm gonna talk about that second part of our phrase, research is teaching is research. And with a different example, sort of, sort of the reverse process from what I just described, where the ideas and the um, initiative is initially coming from the teaching program and to inform and create additional opportunities in our research program. And to uh, illustrate that, I'll talk about some of our work on climate risks to urban forests. Um, this is an example of the ideas really originating and starting with Reedy's, um, both through our environmental studies uh, junior seminar, ES300, which is one of the courses I teach in the environmental studies program. Um, I teach it in collaboration with Josh Howe, who is uh, our environmental historian in the ES program. And the idea with that class is very similar to my upper division biology class as a translational approach that um, combines or that, that connects students to an external stakeholder so that they can articulate um, a, a, a challenge and a need. And then the students work together in this case, because it's ES, they're working together as part of an interdisciplinary team um, across the disciplines of the environmental studies program, biology, chemistry, political science, economics, and history. And so bringing a lot of different approaches and research to bear um, to address that stakeholders um, challenge or question. And um, recent, iterations of that class have uh, been focused on the urban forests of Portland and in providing information to urban forest managers in the city. Um, and this was my introduction into doing urban ecology prior to coming to Reed. I had no experience working in urban um, forest systems. And um, so the, the classroom experiences with this class really were my introduction. In addition, Summer uh, research and thesis research opportunities also here were uh, influential in getting our feet wet with doing work in urban forests and helping to shape um, future directions of this program. And so I'll just highlight the, the work of these two students, Edward Zhu and Claire Brazzi, um, who were both interested in this question of are the biggest trees in the forest more vulnerable to climate change. And they used Portland's urban forest and surrounding um, forests to address that question. And the reason they were interested in that question is we had delved into some recent literature um, that was uh, making this case and, and, and hypothesizing and, and showing some support for the idea that in a warmer, drier future, the largest trees in a given system are gonna be the most impacted by climate change and, and um, drought in particular. The reason is that in order to grow tall, trees um, have to make adjustments to the anatomy and the function of their wood. Um, basically, it results in a trade-off that results in um, the ability to move larger volumes of water longer distances for tall trees but at the expense of increased vulnerability to drought, potentially. Um, so that's, that's the basic idea. But this 
idea had never been tested in urban environments and in some of the species that the students were interested in working on. Um, so that's where their thesis work was focused. However, it presented me with a big challenge, which was um, how to get the samples that the students needed to ask their questions um, in a system like ours, which involves very, very large trees. Large trees in the Pacific Northwest are very large trees. We have the largest um, trees in the highest biomass forests anywhere in the world. Um, and the need to sample the canopy of these large trees presented a, a challenge and a problem, um, but also a cool opportunity. And so in order to address that, we were able to use funds from um, my startup, from internal funds from Reed, to develop a tree climbing research program. And we developed a partnership with a local group called Tree Climbing Planet that specializes in training people to climb trees. And in particular, we were also able to hire Dr. Hannah Prather, um, an expert canopy ecologist from, had recently graduated from Portland State University, is now a postdoctoral researcher in our lab and has been influential in training our students, helping us build a training program for Reedies um, and, and supporting student projects that involve tree canopy access techniques. And so here's uh, Edward Zhu in the top of a 60 meter Douglas fir tree or 200 foot tall Douglas fir tree in Pell Butte Nature Park, one of the tallest trees in the city of Portland, um, safely sampling his, uh, his tree and collecting the samples he needs to test some hypotheses about tall tree vulnerability in urban environments. Okay, so I, I won't go into the details of Claire and and Edward's theses, you can see those in the, um, the thesis archive in the library. But I will just briefly say that we've learned a lot of really interesting things from these studies that the students have come up with. Um, in particular, the answer to that question of are, the, are large trees more vulnerable to climate change depends on where you look in the urban forest. There, and, and it's taught us to be really mindful of these really strong abiotic gradients that exist within cities that are unlike anything we see in rural forest systems. Um, the, the difference between um, ambient air temperatures in the Sandy River Gorge and Pell Butte Nature Park to places like Lentz Park, Brentwood, and even Reed Campus are totally different and, and plants are growing in different environments and that has really different impacts on their physiology and their health. Um, also, different species have been responding differently. Um, all that is to say, we've started to scratch at the surface of some really interesting complexities of this question that is at the forefront of um, ecological literature and understanding climate change impacts on forests. And, and the Reedy research has been the driver of that. Um, we also have started to be able to share our results and help um, managers understand impacts like this so that we've started to see this early on in, in the Reedy's work that some of the trees we, in the places we were working were dying as a result of drought conditions and heat wave conditions um, uh, recently in Portland and we were able to provide some insight into the physiological mechanisms behind this for, for managers. And then this really also was the the initiator for a much larger effort across our lab to be able to identify distributions of tree health in urban environments um, using a combination of canopy and ground-based techniques, as well as remote sensing from airplanes and from satellites um, to uh, be able to to extend the work that the Reedies have done through the thesis process um, to give us and to give managers of some important insight into the distributions of tree health in, in urban environments. That in turn was the basis for, um, for collaboration and conversation with other research groups in the Portland area at Portland State University and Washington State University, Vancouver in particular. And we developed this um, general framework for understanding the importance of urban forest health and community health in an interdisciplinary way that involves um, 
under, a better understanding of the social science and the environmental science dimensions of the urban forests. And we use that to make a pitch to NSF to fund more of this kind of research going forward. And that has resulted in a successful recent competition for the Coupled Natural Human Systems Grant Program at NSF, which is Reed is now the lead institution of a four-year $1.6 million grant from NSF um, to really focus on this urban tree health issue, not just in Portland, but in cities across the US and, um, and, and, and the Reedy interest and in research and creativity were, were the initiator for all of this. Um, so just a, a fun aside here that part of what this this kind of grant provides is expanded opportunities for Reedies to do more of this kind of work, expanded tree climbing opportunities, which has, has been a big draw for students in the lab, um, but also advances on the technology. Uh, so we now have um, a partnership with a group out of Canada that creates sampling um, devices for drones that will allow us to rapidly expand the number of samples we can collect from high canopy positions across the city. Um, and this grant is supporting that work and, and, um, and students will be involved in the use and, and, and this will be a new dimension to the research program that students will get trained up in. Okay, so then to so summarize here, um, this is to me, the teaching is research is really shows how um, this process is really cyclical, that we can support student research through our teaching programs and our teaching programs can support new research um, and to help us develop new ideas. And this is really the case where um, the, the research from these students kickstarted a whole new area and dimension to our research program that didn't exist before and now is carried forward um, in that research is teaching um, way. All right, so um, I guess I'll just wrap this up by saying I'm really grateful again for the opportunity to share this with you. It's, I've only been here a few years. I'm still the newest faculty member in biology and, um, and still feel like I'm just getting my feet wet with a lot of this stuff, but at the same time, the, uh, the creativity and the brilliance of Reedy's has allowed us to move really quickly in, in a lot of new directions. And I'm just so excited about all, all of this work and all of the things we'll do going forward as well. So thanks again. And I think we're gonna, we have some time for questions. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was really incredibly informative, really rich talk. Um, and I appreciate you being here. We do have some questions from the audience um, that I'd like to share with you. Um, first from Michelle. Aaron, how would you describe the difference between translational ecology and conservation biology? Great, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I have this other graphic that I use sometimes that shows um, the, what I see as sort of the differences between sort of basic ecology, more applied ecology or, or more traditional conservation approaches and then translational. And I think the major difference is just in how those relationships are forged between the management and science community. Um, my little graphic often shows that even in applied research, we often have this loading dock model to the research where um, it gets the, the research objectives may be somewhat informed by management outcomes. Um, but then that those two things kind of carry on independently of one another. And then at the end, you, you write a report and drop it off on the loading dock and hope that it gets used, but that there's not always follow up there. I think what translational ecology means and how it's different is that it um, it builds a stronger relationship with more communication, more connection points, um, and much more intentional iteration and adaptation of the research in ways that continue to inform the management. And what we've really learned is that it's not just the management that is um, 
is added to by that process, but the research is added to as well in, in those ways. I, I think I gave an example of it at the beginning where we, we learned something very different because we were working to incorporate the perspectives of the managers and often they can help us understand the systems and the important questions better than, than we can just from our position in the ivory tower sometimes. Great, thank you so much. Um, and would you mind, before we get to the next question, um, if you'll stop screen sharing? Okay. Then we can see more folks. There was a request from the audience. I was trying to do that. It allows me to pause. So the answer to your question is no. Oh, there we go. Oh, you did it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, and then there's a follow up question from Ella, um, who wanted to piggyback on Michelle's question. How might translational ecology be incorporated into other fields, um, such as forestry or silviculture? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, the translational ecology um, is terminology that relates it back to that original editorial. But I think the idea of translational science goes across disciplines. And, um, and actually, the Bill's idea came from translational medicine. Um, so there are other examples of translational processes in other disciplines that uh, and I think it can be applied to any discipline. The basic idea is that the potential end users of the science are involved in the process and um, in ways that accelerate the outcomes of the research getting integrated into um, practice. And so that can happen in, in any, any field, in my opinion. And um, I often use the term translational science more so than translational ecology because it, it's not exclusive to ecology at all. It's just, a, it's just an approach um, that can be applied in anywhere. Thank you. Um, from Richard, class of 1958, he asks uh, a two-parter. I would be interested to know the relative number of students participating in your research that are biology majors and environmental studies majors. He also asks, are you familiar with the work of Nalini Nadkarni, the former faculty at the Evergreen State College, who has done a great deal of tree canopy research? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I would say so far, it seems like we're pretty evenly split between biology and environmental studies in terms of the students that we support through thesis and summer research opportunities. My coursework is, is obviously split. Um, I'm 50% appointed in biology and 50% in environmental studies. Um, and uh, maybe there's a slight um, uh, advantage to in, in the the favor of biology students. I probably have um, advised a few more biology students than ES, um, but pretty evenly spread, split. Um, the, the thing about our ES program to note is that even ES students are biology students in, in, in many ways. They, they, have, they follow the biology curriculum they just also have the interdisciplinary curriculum that they build on top of that. And their thesis process is designed to look very similar to the biology thesis process. So, um, so even the ES students that I work with, it's typically the ES biology students that I directly mentor. But I am a, I'm a co-mentor and an advisor and, a, and just a resource for all of the ES students across the disciplines. Um, the, I forget what the second, Part of that. Oh, Nalini. Yeah. So Nalini, definitely she, her research is amazing. Um, I'm a huge fan of her, especially in the work that she's done kind of since the Evergreen State College and more of the environmental justice work that she does um, in connecting uh, prisoners to ecology and, um, and some really amazing stuff. I'm a big fan of hers. We, I, I'm on the organizing committee for the Urban Ecosystem Research Consortium here in Portland in Vancouver. And last year, um, uh, partly at my, at my begging, um, 
Nalini Nadkarni was our, uh, one of our keynote speakers for that. And that was one of the first times I got to interact with her directly. Um, she's great and, um, and would love to get her here to campus to talk about some of her canopy research as well. Thank you. Um, you touched on this a little bit in the answer you just gave, but maybe you would like to expand. Um, from Jim, can you talk about how your biological perspective blends with the transdisciplinary joint perspective of the ES program? Um, yeah, so uh, could, could you just rephrase, or could you say yeah. that again, Aaliyah? For sure. Um, I'm interpreting it correctly. Can you talk about how your biological perspective blends with the transdisciplinary joint perspective of the ES program? Yeah, I mean, when I saw the job description for this position, I, um, I felt incredibly lucky because I felt like it was exactly what I wanted to do. The, um, as I mentioned, the translational science approach comes into both my biology class, but also the environmental studies class. And so I found really willing partners in the environmental studies program for the approaches and, and the process that I look to implement, implement in my biology program. It's also very well aligned with the, the way that the environmental studies um, wants to approach uh, that coursework and, and thesis work for students as well. So um, I would say that the major difference is that um, the ES program allows me to uh, take my biology hat off more and put on other hats in ways that I really love. Um, uh, you know, you hear a lot of words like transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary. Josh likes to call our ES class non-disciplinary. And uh, we really encourage the students to check their disciplinary hats at the door and come in with a really open mind and learn from each other and work together. And we have, you know, historians that are doing um, uh, uh, analysis of, of remote sensing data sets that are typically used in ecology in that class and ecologists that are doing um, uh, document analysis and policy analysis. And, you know, so checking your disciplinary hat at the door for that class is important for us as faculty, but also um, for the students. And I, I really love that about the, my, my um, experience with the ES program. Great, thank you. Um, this question is a two-part question from Ava. On privately owned forests in Oregon, will the state or district involved allow prescribed, ver prescribed burns versus thinning to manage small woodlands? Mm. Good question. Um, the, I think the short answer is uh, in some cases, um, the longer answer would be that it really depends and you have to look into local jurisdictions and the, and the appetite for that really varies. Um, that's one of the things that is, is behind the work of our TNC partners is to increase the, um, the uh, availability of those kinds of tools, not just for um, federal landowners, not smaller nonprofits and private landowners. I think maybe one of the better examples of that is um, the work we're doing with TNC in, near Ashland in the Ashland Forest Resiliency Project, where the city, the Forest Service, which the, the watershed is a Forest Service managed um, city entity, um, and then private landowners um, all contribute land area to under the um, management objectives of the ash and forest resiliency plan and so private land is is burned in in um, in those cases as part of that larger planning um, uh, process and i would say that right now that seems to be the most uh, the places where there's most opportunity is if um, individual landowners are incorporated into a larger um, planning process like that that their lands can be um, incorporated but you don't see as much opportunity yet um, for private landowners to be able to do that on their own. And Ava's follow-up question, would it be possible to work with your students on uh, their small Oregon woodland? It's largely been untouched for 60 years. 
yes, that would be awesome. Please contact me. We're always, you know, so one of the things about the ES300 class and my Leafs to Landscapes class is that because we want to connect them to real people and real problems, um, we have to do a lot of uh, legwork to establish those connections with, with people and, and to provide that for the students. That's one of the things where we as faculty for, those, for that class um, really have something to provide is in helping establish those connections and then the students can really kind of take and run and grow those connections. Um, so I'm always on the lookout for new partners uh, for, for that classwork and also for thesis work um, would be another, another good way to integrate that. So yes, please reach out. Perfect. And um, Ava Olga has just dropped um, Dr. Ramirez's email into the chat. So definitely feel free to take him up on his generous offer. Um, our last question for the morning is from Jennifer. Was there any difference found relative to tree density in the urban research your students conducted? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. So an important note is that um, the the tree density issue is confounded with the variation in the abiotic conditions we see in the urban environment. The reason it's cooler in one neighborhood and hotter in another is because there's more trees or fewer trees. So um, the trees that are exposed to more extreme temperatures are in low density tree environments. Um, so being able to disentangle that is, is tricky. Um, and the our, our approach has been to really focus on individual tree health. And actually what we, what we see is that um, there uh, is the, the way that we think about competition and its effects on growth and health in rural forests has to be, is pretty different in the urban environment. And um, the, uh, the benefits that trees get by growing near each other um, often far outweigh any of the competitive um, effects in, in these extreme urban environments. So it's a very different system. I'm still learning a lot about it. Like I said, the, the Reedies were my introduction into urban ecology. And it's one of the things that I'm most excited about going forward is continuing to grow that program. Mm -hmm. Then I think we have one more question that's just slipped in. Um, from Charles. Um, thanks, Aaron and Aaliyah and Reed itself for the ES program and the growth of applied fieldwork at Reed with an interdisciplinary approach. I wonder if offering more applied projects and programs might encourage more BIPOC students to become STEM majors. Good question. Um, yeah, I, I would say I'm a little bit ignorant on what the connection between um, interest from BIPOC students and applied research in particular is, but I will say that a big part of the broader impacts of our NSF grant, so um, those of you that aren't familiar, when you write an NSF grant, you need to articulate how the work will advance the intellectual merit of the fields that are um, uh, involved, but also have broader impact outside of those disciplines and, and influence the communities. A lot of that broader impacts work it in for our urban work is focused on realizing that these issues of tree health in cities are closely connected to um, things like historical racism and and um, patterns of um, of disadvantage and disinvestment in neighborhoods and incorporating that into the research and we brought on social scientists from neighboring or, um, institutions to help us um, appreciate and and um, address that both on the research side, but then also use that as an opportunity to, um, to create an attractive research program for BIPOC students that want, that have interest in resolving those issues in their own communities. And we do, we're doing that going beyond just the Reed uh, student body and connecting Reedies to, um, uh, uh, middle school and elementary school students through um, a, a mentorship program that we're developing where um, BDs can connect with students from these neighborhoods that are interested in doing science fair projects related, related to the Reed 
thesis projects. And that um, near peer mentorship is part of the broader impacts and that the focus of that is on these BIPOC communities that we're researching and studying and incorporating students from those communities into the research that way. That sounds really, really wonderful. And what a great and also hopeful note to end this wonderful conversation um, on. Um, so thank you, Aaron. That was really, really great. Um, and thank you um, to everyone for joining us. Thank you for your questions and for coming to today's talk.